All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to Mueller Field Station's virtual Speaking of Nature series. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Ali Esposito, and I am the Conservation Education Outreach Coordinator at Mueller Field Station. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, Mueller Field Station is part of Finger Lakes Community College, and the field station itself is located at the south end of Honeyway Lake. So at Mueller, um, we offer a bunch of different environmental education programs for K through 12 students, uh, college students and community members. And if you'd like to keep up to date on what we're doing here, um, the different events and programs that we offer, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And we also have a monthly newsletter that you can subscribe to. So just, um, you know, an update on our next speaking of nature event that one is scheduled for December 14th and this will be a presentation on maple syrup and honey production and this will be given by Joe Hurley at Kettle Ridge Farm so that should be cool um all of our uh speaking of natures are recorded and we post them on our YouTube channel so if you've missed any in the past if you're interested in the other topics we've covered you can go ahead and like check us out on YouTube. Okay, so I think that's all of the info I wanted to share um, about that. So joining us tonight is Angela Cannon Crothers and she will be diving into nature journaling with us tonight. And nature journaling, I love it. Um, it's an ideal way to explore, observe and connect to the natural world and anybody can do it. And it's a really nice, you know, tool to bring into your classroom or, you know, just into your life. And Angie will tell us all about that. So a little bit about Angie. Um, she is the forest school um, inter and interpretive programs coordinator at Rochester Museum of Science uh, Coming Nature and Center. So may maybe you've heard of this place. It's beautiful. It's amazing. It's um, fairly close to, to Mueller Field Station. Definitely a different uh, environment and habitat, a beautiful space. And she is a former cloud collector, sounds amazing, and wilderness ranger. Um, she has taught in the conservation and horticulture department at FLCC, and she was teaching there for over a decade. Um, I was fortunate enough to have her as an instructor. Um, she has published articles, poetry, and prose in many regional and national magazines literary journals and anthologies, and she's published a children's book, a novel, and a book on herbs and seasonal celebrations. Um, she holds an MS in environmental education and undergraduate degrees in ecology and environmental science. Um, she has many primitive skills, and she definitely enjoys hiking with her new puppy, Rhubarb, who is super adorable. So before I pass it over to you, Angie, um, this speaking of nature is a little bit different. Uh, typically, everybody's muted the entire time. We have the video turned off, but we are going to give you sharing capabilities. So you'll be able to unmute yourself and come on to video if you'd like towards the end of Angie's presentation. She's going to have like an interactive nature journaling portion of it. So. Hop on if you'd like, if you want to unmute yourself and use the video, um, you'll be able to do that. So, Angie, I'm done speaking and over to you. <laughs> oh, Allie, thank you for such a wonderful introduction. And it's really fun to be here. I'm going to uh, present a short PowerPoint um, about nature journaling, hopefully offer some inspiration and, and lots of ideas for you. And then we're going to actually do uh, two sketching exercises and two short writing exercises together. Um, hopefully we'll have time to share some of those. And I'm going to open up the presentation. Give me just a second. Should be able to get it here. And bear with me while I play around with wherever the presentation ended up. <laughs> I'll do it this way. I think I can do it this way. Mm -hmm. 
and I think this is working. All right. All right, so everyone um, hopefully can see this. Um, oh, yes. yes. <laughs> and someone tonight will receive a copy of uh, my latest book, Changing Seasons in the Finger Lakes. It's actually based on um, several years of public of publishing different nature writings in local papers and, um, and regional publications. And it was the winner of the Cayuga Lakes Books Prize for Creative Nonfiction um, in 2019. So um, I have a little, maybe I can turn this off. Maybe it won't matter. So we have nature journaling for personal, scientific, and creative purposes. People have been keeping records of their observations on the natural world for a very, very long time looking at seasonal changes, looking at the hours of daylight, looking at um, the stars, how the plants changed, how the seasons changed. It's really um, been a very human tradition to try to record and anticipate different changes. Um, for such a long time from indigenous petroglyphs where they're looking at, at stars and, and astral events to ancient sea captain log books as people sailed and voyaged around the planet, they have been keeping records. Many well-known explorers, writers, scientists, artists, and inventors have kept journals on nature and their scientific observations. Uh, Charles Darwin, of course, along the, um, the Beagle voyage uh, that he took looking at um, all of the adaptations and the ev uh, natural evolution of species that began in his journals. John Muir, um, Lewis and Clark, the expeditions across the country, um, President Jefferson asked them specifically to keep logbooks and keep journals of their discoveries and what they were finding. So, this whole science of observing nature and seasonal changes is the science of phenology. And a couple of points during the presentation, I'm going to read some short excerpts from the book, my book. And this one is on phenology. And it's from the opening chapter, um, March, what are we waiting for? Phenology is the study of seasonal occurrences. Such occurrences are the notable time, times when the wood frogs first quack or the spring peepers begin peeping. Such quaint records of the past help gardeners know when to plant peas. Morning cloak butterfly enthusiasts recognize when to be peeking under eaves. The feeders of hummingbirds know when to set up their sippers and fiddler foragers learn when to foray. As well, keeping track of daily temperature and precipitation is one way to try and understand the fickleness of weather. The long-term tracking of such seasonal happenings aids all of us in better understanding changing climates in a warming world. Melting ice caps and glaciers are not the only signs of global warming. Migratory birds sense it, whales swim in it, bark beetles, adelgid, and insects with ch crop chumping chomp crunching man mandibles flourish in it. Trees and herbs and even soil microbes all react in one way or another to seasonal changes. Such subtle warmth has a tug on all living things. So with nature journaling, we are involved in studying and connecting and looking at symmetry, relationships and observation looking at structure um, of plants and animals. So it involves many of our, our learnings and our way of viewing the world and seeing the world. But even more than that, nature journaling is a pause button. It's opening a door to the mindfulness of meditation. It's a place for reflection and a space for your thoughts. 
It's a place for observation and recordings of the natural world. A chance to ponder a chance to look at the dates of when you're noting. What's arriving? What is first coming up? It's really a process of attention that is both a study and can be an art as well. And I meant to pre preface this whole program with the fact that I really am not an artist. I enjoy sketching. I enjoy drawing, um, but I would never consider myself um, an artist. But you don't have to be. You can just you keep learning and growing, and it's a it's a practice. So, what do you need to keep a field journal or a nature journal? Well, number one is a sense of curiosity about the world. Paper and something to write or draw with is usually helpful. Uh, some people might learn how to use their their tablets or their um, or their phones for such recording, and that's that's super. I myself always forget to bring my phone when I'm out in the woods, so it's good for me to have a piece of paper. <laughs> so how do you do it? Well, you go outside, or if you're not real fond of the weather, you could just sit by a window and look outside. Um, especially if you have a bird feeder or um, some other place, some nice scenic view outside the window, you don't need much. I always say to start with the date and the place. Um, I've kept journals well my whole life, but for 15 or 20 years, I recorded um, returns of birds and returns of uh, the bloomings of plants. And sometimes I noticed I forgot to write down the year. So the date and the year and the place are really critical. So a really nice way to start um, would be to put together a kit. Um, a number two pencil and a darker pencil is super um, to start with. A lot of people like the mechanical pencils, but whatever works for you, a good eraser. So a lot of times the back of an eraser on the back of a pencil can just smear your paper and it's not too attractive. If you can get a good eraser, like a gummy eraser, um, those work great. A sharpener. Unless you keep a knife in your pocket and you're good at it at whittling. Uh, watercolor field um, paints or colored pencils. These field paints are wonderful if you can order them or find them in a, um, an art store. They come with a paintbrush that you preload with water so that you've always, it's always ready to dip in the colors. It's a really strong um, case for the paints. Um, a magnifying lens can be really nice to have in your kit. A small ruler so you can actually take measurements of what you're looking at and, and get the accurate size for doing research later. Oh, and a journal, sketchbook, again, or paper on a clipboard works just fine as well. So you want to record, again, the date, um, the place. You can record the county. Um, as much details about where you are, the weather, and then start in right in on your observations. They might be words, they might be sketches, um, they might be just little notes. So what you really want to do is be able to explore your curiosity and your sense of wonder, um, like I did with this skunk cabbage, and I'm going to read a little bit about skunk cabbage to you because I think skunk cabbage is absolutely amazing. Odoriferous skunk cabbage roars within the soil before spring has fully sprung. Skunk cabbage, aptly named for its stench, exhibits the rare quality among plants known as thermogenesis. It raises its temperature to actually melt snow and icy soil around its bud. All life creates some heat, I suppose, but theirs is so evident. Just as amazing as their heat is the fact that any one of these wetland stinkers could be hundreds of years old, possibly a thousand years old. The skunk cabbages are our elders. Creating heat is the plant's survival strategy for earlier pollination, earlier spreading into the swamp, protection. In March, the skunk cabbage bloom is shaped like a carnivorous pitcher plant or the toe of the shoe of a mischievous elf. If I whispered to the cabbage that we humans are creating heat too, would the cabbage nod in understanding? Would the cabbage ask if this was our survival strategy also? How would I reply? 
So as you start journaling, you can add your own details, thoughts, or personal reflections. Consider all of your senses, what you know, what you see, what you hear, what you smell, what you feel. And it's I also like to suggest people ask add what they know. Um, you know, what do they think and what do they wonder about what they're looking at? And it is November and people might think this isn't the time for nature journaling, but winter is no exception to getting outdoors to record the wonder of the natural world. Quite the opposite. And uh, these pages here were made in the middle of winter. And again, if it does, there was a few um, pages that I have in this presentation that are from the winter time. Um, fingerless mitts are helpful. And again, if you really don't want to be out there in the cold, um, sitting by a, a window is a fine place to do some nature journaling as well. You can do study sketches um, using quick gestures, an animal or a plant in different forms, um, in different you know, positions. Uh, in order to gain some more familiarity with the subject that you're looking at, um, the one side here that has the plants, I was actually doing a, a study on some very, very similar plants that I sometimes struggle with telling apart. So I thought by drawing them and really studying them and getting to know them, it would help me identify them in the field um, more quickly. Especially when you like to eat some of them, it's good to know which one is which. <laughs> um, including measurements, coloring, behaviors, Adding some of the text in there is a beautiful diagramic type of drawing that you can add to your journal. And you can use your preliminary sketches to do more research later and add some fascinating tidbits of information, um, add some whimsical notes or thoughts um, about that plant or subject that you're looking at. Um, just can make the whole page really a lot of fun. You can draw larger than life. That's where the magnifier comes in handy or taking a picture of something and blowing it up. Um, really, really fun to look at, take something that's very, very small and really um, bring out, it brings out the beauty of that subject. So you can include the actual measurements later of what you're looking at just so that you don't scare anyone, <laughs> that that beetle might be of um, ginormous size or something. And it, by the way, if you've never looked at maple flowers up close, the male and the female, they are quite spectacular. So you can use your, um, your drawings and sketches to create illustrations, um, scientific type of illustrations for ideas and further practice later. This one is not one of mine, but it goes with uh, one of the short readings I wanted to share here. This is from a chapter called The Art of Deception. And and here we go. So nature is the expert at the art of deception. A white twig is on my window and when I touch it, the twig flitters off. In the meadow, I find foam between the goldenrod leaves. On further investigation, the green nymph of the spittle bug is hiding inside. There are insects that imitate other animals, parts of plants, or even spittle. The idea behind these simula simulations can be for both defense against predation and deception in order to gain prey. Such adaptations of mimicry and physical form and behavior display the amazing evolution of natural selection. The buff tip moth is so convincingly a lookalike for the birch twigs where she lays her eggs that one would never notice her. She is the color of silvery birch with a head that looks like the broken end of a birch twig and tail the tips of a similar freshly snapped twig color. One minute there is a twig, the next moment she takes wing and is gone. The fooled stand grappling with such unexpected reality. The critter escapes. If it's me watching a twig turn into a plume moth and fly away, I giggle in surprise. Maybe the world has a sense of humor. 
how many thousands of years, I wonder, does it take to evolve f physical characteristics to something one is not? Does a creature just lean into a tree and spend so much of their sh life sharing a sense of oneness with that species that over time they become itself a mirror image? Is it like dogs who are said to grow to look like their owners over time? Or couples who in their elder years also begin to resemble one another? Can I too lean against a tree for years and begin to resemble its crusty bark? Would my offspring become more and more tree-like if, if they did the same? But adaptations take time unless you are, say, a fruit fly. Fruit flies lay about 500 eggs at a time and create a new generation each week. It only takes them about a month to take on a new trait or two. Let me go back here. So you can also um, try your hand at landscapes. Um, it's really nice to kind of make a little picture frame with your hands, try to get that whole landscape in there. Um, start with your tallest tree and make sure you include it um, on the page so it doesn't go off the page. Or if it goes off the page, so what? You know, that'll be beautiful too. Uh, within that landscape, you might want to pull out some nearscapes. So highlight some of the species um, that reside in that habitat as well and give them a little bit more attention. Landscapes are very popular, very fun. Um, making messy sketches of animals in motion, um, you can use later for uh, for a more formal sketch or a finished um, product. It's really fun to try to get those positions that an animal might be doing. Uh, you can practice with your own cat or dog before you head out to the field, if you like. Using photography for nature journaling is a wonderful tool as well. You can snap pictures with your phone and use these for sketching or watercolor painting later. You might even be able to make a nature journal entirely using photos and adding some text in there. You can use your observations to contribute to citizen science projects, things like Project Feeder Watch, Bud Burst, and many others. Or you could join a social media platform to connect with other nature journalers, such as the Nature Journal Club um, on Facebook, this example here is one um, from the Facebook page from the Nature Journal Club on social media. I really don't post anything on there. I peruse it like crazy. I really um, don't feel confident enough most of the time to post my things on this page. It's, it's very, very well done. Most of these are um, done by really fine artists and every once in a while, an amateur like myself comes along and gives me some confidence that maybe I could do it too. So I like to also say get writing out there. So it's not just nature journaling is not just for artists. Um, it's for thinkers and poets and writers and anyone who has an interest in how the world works. For inspiration, you can read poetry, um, nature writing, outdoor writing, essays. Um, can all be very inspiring and helpful. Um, this poem art I have on this page is inspired by um, Walt Whitman and especially um, a book I have that is um, Whitman Illuminated. And it was really fun um, to do this. So taking notes out there in the field can oftentimes lead to other things. So this was um, a page from a journal uh, from a few years ago, September strands. I was weaving together some ideas of what I was noticing about September, um, what, what connected it all together. And I ended up with um, an essay um, in this book called September strands. And I'll read you a little bit um, from here. September is sunflowers slumping their shoulders, heads of falling yellow hair, bent as if in prayer, preparing seeds our winter songbirds can enjoy. In September, the curtain is raised, the unveiling of chlorophyll pigments of orange carotene, red anthocyanin, 
and yellow xanthophyll in leaves take center stage. September's monarch butterflies and troops of green darner dragonflies gathering, preparing to migrate before a first frost drops crickets in the fields like stones, leaving us a sudden silence. That was just part of the beginning of a much longer essay. So if you want to get those thoughts flowing and you're struggling where to start, another thing to do is create lists. Um, lists of birds you saw, lists of trails you want to hike, lists of um, flower names that you know uh, can all really get, um, get your pen moving. And other things you can do in your journal besides um, just plain writing and sketching, making maps. You can map your your backyard, your neighborhood, follow an ant <laughs> and map the route, um, map your favorite secret place, map a squirrel's route and territory. So that takes a lot of observation, seeing where they're going. Um, you could even put in little notes about what they're doing along their, the way. You can make a sound map. This is a really fun thing to do. You put yourself in the center of a circle, um, your inner circle are those sounds you hear um, you know, within 50 feet or so, or hundred yards tops. And then your outer circle is what you hear farther out in the distance. You can just get plain old creative. You can, um, do leaf stamping in your book. You can press flowers. You can paint with walnut ink. Um, you can just do experiments with colors and just have fun. Um, a scrapbook style journal is um, a beautiful thing as well and offers a lot of create creativity for someone that maybe feels like they can't draw. Um, you can do pressed flowers, you can do glued items, leaf rubbings, prints, again, smash, smash art, pressed art, um, natural inks. All of these are fun ways to experience the natural world, learn, learn more about the colors and what you're observing. So what are, what are some of the things you can just keep in your field journal? Um, again, pressed flowers and leaves. Uh, you could put in recipes for a picnic, um, your thoughts, your poems, your drawings, uh, again, your records of dates, weather, observations, new discoveries, wild edibles, um, so much more that you can include in your field journal. And you can make it very personal um, and very much your own style. So with that, I wonder what you will keep in your field journal. Um, and here's a very simple example, a press leaf. And on the other side is um, drawing with uh, dirt and crushed stones that I found near my journal um, just to get some color. So what I'd like to do here is invite anyone who would like to do some activities together um, to turn on your, your camera, if you like, um, turn on your, or unmute yourself, if you like, and I will give some guided practice here. We are gonna do um, a leaf line drawing. So just a simple line drawing. And then we will do a circle um, and turn that into something. And then two short writings uh, for, for our activity. So the first one we're gonna do is a line drawing. And a line drawing is when you get your pencil onto the paper and you try not to really lift it up. You try to follow the edges of whatever you're looking at. So I am going to hold a leaf up nice and still, and you are going to almost be like a snail that is tra traveling the edges of this leaf with your pencil onto your paper. And without moving your lifting up your pencil too much. Um, try just tracing the outline of this leaf and just making a basic line drawing. Angie, can you unshare your screen so we can see the leaf a little bit larger? Yes, good idea. Thank you, Lisa. Lisa, hi. Hey. 
Oh my gosh, it has been six forever. years, my friend. Six? Six and a half. Too long, way Thank too you. long. All right, excellent. So nice to see you. So nice to see you. So for now, you're just doing the outline. Let's see if you can finish that up. Um, do that last little snail traveling those, the last bit of line on the bottom down to the stem. And I love doing this activity with kids because it kind of puts us all on the same level plane because I'll ask everyone to hold up their line drawing and we can see that we can all basically, we all basically have a shape that looks like the leaf. So I challenge you if you'd like to hold up your line drawing and show everyone. You won't, might not be able to see some of them too well. Oh, that's good if you hold them right up. Oh, nice. Nice. <laughs> Super. Yeah. And um, most of you would probably even be able to recognize from that um, that it is um, some type of oak. And from here, with a basic line drawing, you can add in your center line and some of the, the veins of the leaf if you wanted to. Just a few more details. You might even put in some little caterpillar chew marks in there. There's a little chewed edge and a couple little holes as you start to notice more. And if you wanted to do a little bit of shading, you can see where there's some darker areas where the leaf is kind of a little wobbly, like it's got a little waving to it. You could just add a little bit of shade, maybe smudge it with your, with your finger afterwards, smudge that pencil mark, and just give it a little bit of, of depth. And just take one more minute to finish a few basic details. And then if folks would like to share again, we'll actually see some almost entirely new leaves based on just a few simple details that you started to notice. I'm gonna hold them right up to the screen. Oh, look at that. Oh, it really, just from a simple line drawing to these detailed leaves, that is beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. 
so it's fun too, right? It's fun to just let go of everything else you're supposed to be doing and just do something for fun. So the next activity I'm gonna ask you to do is just very simply to draw a circle. And I'm gonna draw one myself. Oh, my circle's not too perfect. I already made a smudge. But if you wanna just draw a basic circle, And a circle is very flat, you know, it's flat right now. It has no dimension. It has no um, form. And we're going to start to turn our, our circle into a sphere. So what we're going to want to do is add some shading. And I'll bring this closer in just a minute. We're going to pick one side that the light is coming from. And I'm going to make a little arrow here that's showing that my light is coming from the corner. And then we can just do some simple hashing marks around the opposite side that show a little bit of shade. We can just do straight lines or a smudge. I'm just going to give it a little bit of shade on one side, and the light is coming in on the opposite side. And if something is spherical and an object and there's light coming from one side, on the other side, there's got to be a shadow, right? So down on the bottom, I'm going to give it some kind of, it's not going to be just floating in space. I'm going to give it a little bit of a shadow. And now I've started to give it a little bit more of a form. It's a little bit more like a sphere than just a flat circle on a piece of paper. So it's, it's, in, it's in a place. It's not just floating in space on my paper. And it's got a little bit of roundness and form to it. And now I'm going to ask you to turn it into something. So you can turn it into almost whatever you want. Um, I had picked some rose hips this morning. Wait, let me see if I can get it right here. Um, but then I dropped them and that famous puppy rhubarb got into my rose hips and he thought they were quite delicious. So for a rose hip, you could kind of oval it out a little bit. You could also turn it into an acorn. Um, acorn has a little bit of a point on the bottom. It's got the cap. Um, you could turn it into an apple, a fruit, whatever you want. Take a minute. Um, you can be creative and silly, whatever you want to do, and see if you can turn that sphere into a subject. I'm going to have to oval mine out quite a bit more because I want it to be more like a like a rose hip. I think mine's going to be a half eaten rose hip. <laughs> And here I am without that good eraser. That's okay.
and we will just take another minute here to finish up a couple of details and whatever you turned your spear into. I think mine looks more like one of those cocoons that Allie and I were talking about earlier today. <laughs> like a moth cocoon. Everybody looks so hard at work. Need to break in one's concentration. All right, anyone want to give it? Hi, Maureen. <laughs> How are you? Really good. <laughs> so, would anyone like to show their sphere made into a subject? What does Frank have there? A little bit closer, Frank. Oh, wait, I think I see it. Oh, it looks like fruit. It's an apple. Oh, it is. Oh, I love it. Very nice. Fun. Maureen, would, did you draw something? Oh, not yet. I, I had a cat on my lap and she was wanting to be petted, so. <laughs> I'm not gonna share mine. I tried to draw a frog and it just, no. Oh, come on. Oh my gosh. A frog from a sphere. No, it's really not. It doesn't even make any sense. So <laughs> I'll show you later. <laughs> All right. I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> so, um, I also wanted to do, um, at least 1 writing activity together before we, before we stop. And so I thought if we only had time to do the, the haiku, we'll do the haiku, but I will give you. The other prompt that you can do on your own um, another time. I just want to make sure we have some time to share. Um, but this one is a four directions writing prompt. So from wherever you are, if you find um, an observation spot that you can use frequently, it's always nice to have a place like that. But wherever you might be um, in each of the four directions, you can and even if you don't know what they are, just draw yourself four directions. Um, and write what to the north of you connects you to that place and a couple of words about what connects you and what to the south of where you are connects you to the place and what to the east and go through all of the directions. And in the end, you have something that you could work with that's probably beautiful just by itself. Um, I am connected here by the North Winds, by Lake Ontario, by growing up um, on, on around Decoit Bay, um, to the west of me, I am connected and you might have relatives or something and you can come up with a really pretty little piece that way. But I thought together we might try, um, a classic haiku, which is a wonderful nature writing type of poem. Um, traditionally this Japanese poetry was meant to, um, to comment on the season or surroundings of where you are at that moment. So season, nature, um, the whole idea of the five syllables, seven syllable, five syllables doesn't entirely translate into English. So I always ask people not to get too caught up on the syllables, but to think about um, that very closing line as being sort of a pow. Um, and I'll give you some examples. Um, this is the old pond by Matsu Basho. I might not be saying it right, but he's a famous um, haiku poet. An old silent pond. A frog jumps into the pond. Splash. Silence again. And this one is um, Lighting One Candle by Yosa Busan. The light of a candle is transferred to another candle. 
spring twilight. So three lines. Would you want to hear one more for an example? One more? Okay. Uh, Joyce Clement, it's called Birds Punctuate the Days. So three lines. Period. One blue egg all summer long. Now gone. So if we can take um, a couple minutes here and create our own haiku, you might think about the weather, the season that we're in, or the place where you are. And we'll take just a couple minutes here.
And maybe um, just another minute to finish that final thought. Make any final change you want and. I would love um, if folks might want to share a haiku or two of their own. So Kira Stephenson says, oh, let me see if I can see that again. I'll open up the chat. Putting it in the chat's a great idea too. Yeah, too. Um, I see the leaves falling. Oh, how they slow me down. Stop. Watch them touch the ground. Very nice. So great. Someone else? I'll share a couple. I'll read them. Thanks, Frank. Silence tasted whole in a forest sleeping nourishes the soul. And the second one, early morning frost, delicate crystals underfoot, erased by a sun kiss. Ooh, very nice. Thank you. I'll do one. I'll read mine after her. Oh, yay. Go. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm, I can. I, I can hear you. Okay, so here it, it's not it's not very like outdoors naturey, but <laughs> here it is. My foot remembers what it's like to dance and leap. Time might make this real. I think it has to do with where you are right now. <laughs> it might. <laughs> And someone else too? There's oh, one in the chat too. There's one in the chat. Oh, one in the chat. <gasps> Splitting wood, small spark burning bright, cozy home. Oh, I want to be there. <laughs> I'll read I have and okay. um, Yeah, and that and then I'll read one too. Go ahead, Lisa. The moon vanishes, hidden by our long shadow. Still it is unaltered. Mm. There's an eclipse tonight in case anybody didn't know. Oh. It's at one o'clock in the morning and it's going to be raining here and 30 degrees, but it'll still be happening. One to four. It doesn't care. I have one. Um, this one's called November. Bronze leaves, cold mud with frosty edges, old buck walking. And then this one doesn't have a, a, a title. Red eyes at night, traveling along the yard edge. Skunks. <laughs> Love that. I'm gonna share one. The air is cold. Spiders seek warmth in the bathroom. I let them be. Yes. Look at this. We are all poets. We are all artists. Oh, I think I got okay, but I don't have my picture. <laughs> oh, well, Kat. I can you can hear me anyway. Oh, hey, Kate. Yeah, I bet I, I don't know. I couldn't I I'm not familiar with this program. But anyway, so I moved to a house way, 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 way high on top of the highest hill. And down below me is some um, hemlock lake, but I can't see it from here. I'm just way up and it's way down there. But anyway, high home of mine between sky and lake clouds. And there's such a weird, it's the strangest place because I can have a low ceiling and there's clouds coming up from the lake and I'll be right in between both cloud systems. So neat. So. Very beautiful. Thank now you I'll turn sharing. myself off and try to get my face. Oh, no, no, it's so nice to see your face. Um, I want to read Catherine put one up too. Um, in Earth's broad shadow, 
Tonight the beaver moon becomes a drop of blood. Very cool. All poets, all poets, all artists. Hey, Maureen, <laughs> are you scootering around the house? Knocking I, things yeah. over? <laughs> I actually, uh, I named it. Yeah, I don't know if you could say my scooter. Yeah, her, uh, his name is Bronco Billy. <laughs> <laughs> I named him Bronco and my husband put the, the Billy on the end of it. <laughs> and then, you know what? A week and a half after I get it, I'm looking at the directions like near the seat and it says, do not move any further, any faster than a normal walking pace. Do not coast and do not use it on stairs. So I guess I haven't really been good on directions. <laughs> well, you're, yeah, you got, those are the, those are the rules you got to break. Although I don't recommend the stairs. Stairs, no, but, but, but coasting, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Can't not coast on a scooter. I know, right? Isn't that what a scooter's for? <laughs> <laughs> well, Ellie, I want to find out how Who we won? get how oh. how we get a winner for the book. So uh, I have a list of the attendees, and I I put it in a random like number generator. So I did do it, and I have a winner, and and it is. Frank, Frank, you won. Yay. <laughs> Wonderful. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, Wonderful. you're welcome. I just, um, I need your, if you can, you know, enter, or I can give you my email and you can send me your address so I can mail you the book. Okay. Uh, that's on winning the book. It's really good. I don't know if you've read it, but it's very. Oh, good. I can't put it down. It is so wonderful. Yeah. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad that everyone could come here tonight and I hope you all had fun and are leaving with some uh, inspiration to continue your own practice of nature journaling, whatever that might be and whatever it might look like. And thank you so much for being here. It's wonderful yeah. to see you yeah. all. Thank you. Oh, Angie. Thank you for joining. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for the inspiration, Angie. Bravo. Anytime. Thank you for hosting the event and uh, sharing with us. My pleasure. My pleasure. Lisa, it has been way too long. You need to do something about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we get a pass for the last two years, but next spring, babe, I'm coming to visit. That would be wonderful. It would wonderful. Be. Um, where can you purchase your book? Like other, I know you can get it on Amazon. But yeah, you can get it on Amazon, which is fine, but um, you can also buy it at Artisans in Naples. Um, there's copies at Coming Nature Center. Okay. And yeah, those are two local places. And if you go through Cayuga Lake Books now, it just shuffles you over to Amazon. So oh, really? okay. unfortunately, you can't get away from Amazon if you... Um, if you try to order online, but it's still getting the book out there, so that's fine. Frank, I'm going, I'm just going to put my email in the chat. If you can see the chat. Actually, it was in the um, reminders for oh, this perfect. attempt. I just looked it up and um, so I'm going to email it to you now. It's, it ends with flcc.edu, right? 